anything above and beyond that, you start to lose the selectivity of the outcome you were desiring to get out of it, and you're starting to get into the territory of So guys, Derek from PlaceMoreLeads.com. Today we're going to be circling back to the minimum effective dosage discussion. And this is something I've talked about many times before. I've talked about using um, the least you can get away with to yield the maximum benefit with the least um, result, resulting deleterious side effects. Um, because ultimately the more longevity you have is the more performance you can milk out of each phase of drug exposure. You want to make the most out of each milligram of drug exposure because ultimately overburdening your body will eventually lead to your organs fighting back. And it is just an eventual decline with life, unfortunately, where you are just slowly getting towards a suboptimal function and the PEDs do not really, you know, help in that regard. They help you get to that point, you know, sooner every time you push these super physiologic boundaries. So, you know, obviously the safest way to go about it while still being mindful of we want to make uh, actually be productive with our time and make the most of what we're using. I wanted to circle back and kind of just touch on the selectivity of certain compounds and why it makes sense to use certain dosages. Like sometimes it, it's like, OK, if we have this all around like great drug. Why don't we just like blast it into the sky if it's so well tolerated and safe versus, you know, stack it with something else. And I've I've done a video on that before on like stacking versus uh, single compounds. I, I don't remember what it was called. If I can get a, if I can find the card to it, I'll put it up in the corner. But one good example of why this is important, too, that I probably didn't touch on in the video, or at least it wasn't a real life example of a drug losing selectivity was uh, something I want to bring to light because um, you may or may not have seen my videos I did on SARMs um, with the injectable SARMs experiment where I basically exemplified or at least I hypothesized that when you inject SARMs, you bypass this first pass effect that otherwise is responsible for creating some of the metabolites that inherently are responsible for some of the tissue selective properties of the parent compound. So by that, what I mean is SARMs are supposed to have a relative lack of androgenicity where they don't affect the prostate, don't affect your hair, don't affect a myriad of different things that would otherwise be unwanted side effects when used in a clinical setting in women, in children, etc. Um, but one thing we do notice is not only the method of administration potentially changing the compound's action entirely where, you know, the metabolites are potentially involved in retaining the tissue selective nature of the entire compound itself, but above and beyond that, at the dosage deployed, one thing you notice is that in a dose dependent manner, it does not seem like SARMs, you know, build muscle linearly or like, it's not like anabolic steroids do either, but they seem to have a higher, higher ceiling in terms of anabolic activity than do SARMs. And is this just because of their off target interaction with things that are not the androgen receptor and, you know, their interaction with glucocorticoid receptors and whatnot, you know, it's kind of up, up for debate, but at the end of the day, you know, steroids are going to build more muscle than the current SARMs in development, um, or at least most of them, you know, when you stack up certain, you know, m synthetic anabolic steroids, you know, they're going to, um, at a certain threshold, you know, certain SARMs are going to stack up milligram for milligram, but then at a certain, and might even outperform the steroid, but then at a certain point, the steroid sort of starts to trail ahead and leave the SARM in the dust where there seems to be no real additional benefit to pushing the SARM dosage higher. At least that is what I've seen anecdotally. Um, so like, for example, if you take 300 milligrams of test versus 125 milligrams of test, or you take 600 milligrams of test, like we have clinical data that proves that it's significantly more effective at building muscle. When you have some of these SARMs, you know, they're very effective at, you know, like five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams. And they, you know, their rate of diminishing return seems to be a lot, it has a lower ceiling on a weekly overall drug exposure than the synthetic anabolic steroids. And, you know, this isn't really the point of comparing steroids versus arms in terms of which is more potent at building muscle. I think, I think at a, the minimum effective dose for the respective compound, they're actually quite, um, 
most some of them are quite good at what they do you know some are pretty bad but some are actually quite good and this is sort of what i want to get back to is with the tissue selective nature not only of like even some steroids too not just SARMs is there's a certain dosage that they were you know not necessarily designed to start sucking at but they just do you know and one example of why is a beta blocker that I have been deploying recently during my cheat days and I know this is kind of a weird topic but one thing I was noticing is every time I would have a cheat day regardless of how much I want to uh, be healthy, once in a while, I need to kind of let myself go off the rails and eat a bunch of shitty food. The result from that is a giant subsequent spike in blood pressure and giant spike in my resting heart rate to the point where you are, I'm literally walking around with like a 85 to 90 resting beats per minute heart rate. And it's just not good and it's not healthy. And one thing that I saw um, used by Vigorous Steve that I thought was a very good idea was the acute um, intermittent use of a beta blocker, namely Nibivolol, for its very selective interaction with the beta receptor. So specifically, um, many of the side effects associated with beta blockers are because of their blockade of beta 2 receptors. And that's for this reason, beta blockers that selectively block um, beta one adrenergic receptors, um, are termed cardio selective and they produce fewer adverse effects, um, than those drugs that non-selectively block both beta one and beta two receptors. And this is why Nibivolol is such a good choice as a beta blocker for somebody who is trying to, um, use it for its cardio protective effects. And this is sort of why I use it very intermittently during some of these, uh, acute exposure phases to <laughs> super physiological amounts of shitty food, I guess, um, where I just like put my heart in kind of a stress position that I otherwise want to take the burden off. And it also seems to lower appetite and prevent me from going off the rails as much. So Nibivolol in particular is the most um, beta one selective of the beta blockers tested being approximately 3.5 times more beta one selective than bisoprolol. However, the drug drug's receptor selectivity in humans is more complex and depends on the drug dose and a genetic profile of the patient taking the medication. The drug is highly cardio selective at five milligrams. So for all intents and purposes, you know, tissue selectivity of a SARM, of an anabolic steroid, of a whatever, of any kind of compound that we're referring to, not just in an anabolic context, but you know, um, fucking anything that is trying to produce a expected or wanted outcome, you want it to ideally be selective in that you were getting a targeted outcome rather than byproduct satellite interaction with other receptors and causing a bunch of unwanted side effects. So Nibivolol is highly cardio selective at five milligrams. In addition, at doses above 10 milligrams, Nibivolol loses its cardio selectivity and blocks both beta one and beta two receptors. So, and while the recommended starting dose of Nibivolol is five milligrams, sufficient control of blood pressure may require dosages up to 40 milligrams. Furthermore, Nibivolol is also not cardio selective when taken by patients with a genetic makeup that make them poor metabolizers of Nibivolol and other drugs or with CYP2D2 inhibitors. Um, anyway, so basically there is a, you know, a very, very blatant threshold where the minimum effective dose of nabivolol sort of trails into this uh you know less selective nature of the drug like ideally you were trying to just interact and uh block the beta 1 receptors as i mentioned earlier but once you start to get into this uh you know beta 2 blockade you start to get into this lack of cardio selectivity where the drug is no longer producing the desired outcome with like mostly benefits with almost no side effects. You know what I mean? So this is sort of ties back to anabolics as well as other things in a performance enhancing context where there is, you know, other outcomes similar to this Nibivolol example where there is a minimum effective dose where you reach a desired outcome in terms of muscle growth, in terms of adrenergic signaling, in terms of whatever that is going to produce a expected outcome in a protein accretion, nitrogen retention context, in a, um, I don't know, like psychoactive context in the gym, in a whatever context. But anything above and beyond that, you start to lose the selectivity of the outcome you were desiring to get out of it, and you're starting to get into the territory of 
spiking side effects relative to a relative lack of improvement in the benefits, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So at the end of the day, basically you have to understand that stacking sometimes makes sense, not just because um, it's like a fancy, you know, like advanced technique used by guys who are, you know, just want to abuse a bunch of different compounds. Rather, it may actually be a healthier way of going about performance enhancement where you are leveraging the minimum effective dose from many different vectors to achieve a cumulative effect rather than hammering one vector super hard to achieve the same performance performance enhancing outcome but if you hammered the one vector too hard rather than doing a little bit a minimum effective amount of each one to achieve the same overall outcome you get a shit ton of side effects because of the lack of drug selectivity you're going to encounter by pushing that super high dosage territory. So I hope that makes sense in terms of what I'm trying to say. Like, for example, I've often talked about, you know, um, like in anabolics, you know, does it make sense to use overlapping compounds to just hammer the AR when you could otherwise use something that is a potent AR agonist during a cutting phase? And then on top of that, you know, use a reasonable dose of that stacked with a reasonable dose of something that is potent at antagonizing glucocorticoid receptors and using a reasonable dose of that to inhibit muscle protein breakdown, netting you an overall greater amount of um, just uh, netting more protein accretion overall and or and or preventing catabolism that would otherwise occur in a steep deficit, you know, or, you know, a little bit of uh, something else in another vector to uh, drive another pathway pathway of hypertrophy or performance, thus compounding on top of the other minimum effective dosages to yield an overall greater outcome or an outcome comparable to a great outcome with a shit ton of side effects that would otherwise come from a giant dose of one or two drugs that you just hammer way too hard because it's the only thing you understand. You know what I mean? So that is the sort of uh, takeaway message is understand the compounds that you're using, I guess. And, um, you know, uh, deploy safe practices, I guess, and use them intelligently with one another rather than just, you know, hammering drugs that overlap in their effects or lose their selectivity because you're just pushing the boundaries way too hard, trying to achieve an outcome that could otherwise be achieved with a much safer level of drug via many different vectors stacked on top of one another. Some that aren't even like underground things, like saying some, a lot of this stuff is like over the counter, like very basic shit that people don't even take into account, you know? Um, things that can be stacked on top that uh, have actual, you know, significant outcomes. Like uh, the injectable L-carnitine is something that I feel is uh, potentially going to be leveraged by many more people in the future that as an overlapping um, extra vector to stack, stack on top of whatever they're using to avoid having to push the androgens much higher than they otherwise would if they were just focusing on one thing and hammering it as hard as they can until they get unbearable side effects. You know, there's lots of things to look at that have that like little extra boost that then lead to a compounding level of well-tolerated, longevity-minded, high-performance outcomes. So take from that what you will. And um, it's not that hard to find some of this stuff in terms of just digging into the drugs, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, it's uh, selectivity and whatnot, the pharmacology and biochemistry. It's all interesting too, if you like you care about this stuff to begin with and even watch this video, it's highly likely that you'll wanna read about it when you are uh, deploying these drugs. So I recommend you do so because it's uh, publicly available information and it's uh, much better to design your um, protocols based around that. And at the end of the day, I think it is an overall more uh, conservative and responsible approach to your own performance enhancing uh, compound selection. So take from that what you will. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, bitch, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. My TRT clinic, as well as Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, Turnkey, Nootropic, and pre-workout formulas I designed myself from scratch. And anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below and sign up for the newsletter too if you want to get my deep dives into bodybuilding pharmacology because you're not going to get sent those emails if you don't sign up for that so thank you guys for watching talk to you soon